Welcome to a brand new edition of the Lucas and Lucas podcast. Lucas Franco alongside Mike Lucas. We are on the eve of the NBA playoffs and the Brooklyn Nets begin their quest for their first ever NBA championship on Saturday night against the Boston Celtics. Obviously, if this happened 10 years ago, this would be uh, one of the greatest moments of each of our lives, but we'll take it right now. Mike, what are your thoughts here as the Nets get set to uh, open the postseason as NBA title favorites for the first time ever? I'm ecstatic. And the Celtics were the team of the four in the play-in tournament that I actually wanted to face more than anyone else, even though they're a tougher challenge than, let's say, Charlotte would have been. I just go back and look at the trade that sent Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown and all those picks to Boston in exchange for a washed-up Kevin, Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce, and Jason Terry, and how at that moment it felt like we had hit rock bottom. And there was no climbing out of that hole in Boston – was set up for this decade plus of success with young talent. And you fast forward a few years, and although some of those picks hit, they hit home runs with, Brooklyn has a better chance to reach the NBA Finals before Boston has ever done that. And just a sweet, uh, sweet, sweet feeling of revenge and gotcha is awesome. I also can't stand the Celtics. The Nets are healthy. Allegedly, will they stay that way? TBD, we will see, but they played really good basketball down the stretch. They needed to win at least four of their final five games to secure that two seed. They win all five. They did it while beating some relatively competitive competition. And I have not been this excited for a playoff run in the NBA since I've been a a real adult. Like I I just haven't been this excited for any of my teams in the post, even when the Giants won the World Se- uh, Super Bowls, excuse me, they came in as the six and the four seed. Like it wasn't like they were expected to do this. I've, I don't know if I've ever been in the shoes of, hey, you're the hunted, not the hunter in the postseason. And I'm, I'm ready to embrace it. And I can't wait for the first game on Saturday. I'm like freaking out over here. Because obviously we know that if the Nets play the way they're capable of playing, they can't be beat. That's just straight up what it is. Harden, Durant, Kyrie, I mean – Good luck stopping those guys if, if everyone's clicking. It just, it just feels like I, I just had these things coming across my mind. I, I look at, you know, James Harden's playoff history is not great. I look at the fact that the whole year, Harden and Kyrie Durant just, they played eight games together the entire year. And what, why should any reasonable human being believe that, oh, just because it's the playoffs, now they're all going to be healthy for four straight playoff rounds and win the title? That has me freaking out. The James Harden having a post on the Nets Twitter. If you enter the code Harden, you get 50% off tickets to games one or two. 50% off because they see the Knicks got 15,000 tickets sold in like 10 minutes, sold out their arena, and the Nets are having a really tough time selling out their arena. And it just, it just makes my, these things are just adding up that are like, oh, it just, it makes me crazy because I'm, you're ecstatic, I'm ecstatic, but there isn't this whole, I guess we just got to embrace it. Like the Nets are never going to be what the Knicks are. It's just the, it's just the unfortunate reality of, of basketball in the New York city area and then in the tri-state area is the Knicks are just this complete mammoth juggernaut and the Nets are always going to be the, even though they're the better team, the more talented team, they're sort of the little engine that, that, that is trying to like get up the hill. They're just, they're never going to get that, that you no know, city euphoria. I think part of that is the brand new still, and you will never have ties and, you know, deep rooted fandom in a team that's been in Brooklyn for what, six years? The Knicks, think about the Knicks misery. If you're a Knicks fan, this is the most excited you've been since the seventies. I mean, that's a, that's a lifetime for some of these people. So it doesn't surprise me that all these Knicks fans in New York city, I know it's not their first playoff series. I mean, Carmelo took them and they've been in the playoffs, but as a four seed, this team, like it doesn't surprise me in one bit that people are jumping and, fighting to get these Knicks tickets as opposed to the Nets who've only been there four years. Now, if we fast forward to the year 2057 and the Nets have been close, but haven't won a championship and they go on this long drought in 2057, I'm sure the Nets have a chance to have a much deeper uh, natural fan base with the Brooklyn, New York city community. But at the moment, yeah, it doesn't matter how good the Nets could be. The Knicks will have more, 
if, if the Knicks throw a parade for making the playoffs and the Nets throw a championship parade, the Knicks would have more people out there. Oh, we yeah. made the playoff parade than Brooklyn would have for winning it all. And unfortunately, it just is what it is. And there's nothing in the next three months that will change the fact that New York City, for better or worse, is a Knicks basketball city. So you, you look at the Nets, the way they're, they're shaping up here. James Harden, obviously, has never won anything. Made, the, made one NBA Finals uh, nine, nine years ago with the Thunder and is just has a history of just collapsing in the playoffs. You have that narrative going. You have Steve Nash, who's never, never been to an NBA Finals coaching this team. He, he's never been through this before. You have Kevin Durant, who's trying to prove that he made the right decision going to Brooklyn. You have Kyrie Irving, who orchestrated the entire thing. Uh, trying to live up to that he made the right decision and there's just all these all these narratives just just lining up all these like haven't been there haven't done that players on this team and it's and listen if they if they win man it's gonna be it's gonna be so special and uh I, I, I'm so excited but so nervous at the same time and I'm really really concerned about the path the path to the finals here because you win this series you can face the heat of the Bucks in round two the Bucks this year I do have a different feeling about them than I have in the past. Even uh, even though they're not, you know, they're not the one seed. They're not. They're not entering the playoffs as the haunt as the hunted. They're have a little more, uh, a little bit of more of an underdog mentality here. I feel like Drew Holiday is really. I I, I hate to say I, I can't believe that he's actually making a big difference for that team, but he is. And if, it, if they do end up facing the Nets, he's going to cause a lot of headaches for Kyrie Irving. And then if let's say the Bucks lose to the Heat in the round one, which is certainly plausible because it happened last year in the second round, the, the Heat are an atrocious matchup for the Nets. Bam out of bio will eat them alive. Duncan Robinson and Tyler Hero are two of the most elite shooters in the, I've ever seen in the league. By the way, did you see the picture of Jimmy Butler that ESPN posted on their Twitter yesterday? It had to be photoshopped. It I mean, th- th- there's no way that Jimmy Butler is that yoked. It's just impossible. I mean, that, I texted, that's like I texted Eli and he did not answer. So I don't know what that what that says about the uh, validity of the picture or not. But but either way, so if you if you're if you assuming assuming that you don't have much issues with the Celtics, which I mean, everyone says it's a, it's, it's a four or five game series, but I mean, Jason Tatum's gonna have a, at least one or two 50, 50 point games here. So I, I wouldn't be shocked if it went six, uh, but you know, you know, you just never know with these things. And then let's say you do get through the heat of the box and you got to face the Sixers who are basically can walk to the Easter conference finals with their eyes closed. Cause they're going to be, they're, they're going to sweep the, the wizards probably. And then they get to face either the Hawks or the Knicks in round two. And that's going to be a walkover. So they, they have an easy path and, Listen, if the Nets are going to win the championship this year, they're going to earn every single second of it, and that that is that is for sure. I just uh, the way the whole playoff schedule set up with the first round being late May, and selfishly, my busy season ends in about a week and a half, so I am perfectly positioned to be on my couch, which is right there, my TV's right here, watching every second of the Nets playoff run. And that doesn't typically happen with my line of work and how irrelevant the Nets have been. I mean, they haven't been on national TV before this season more than once or twice a season since I've left the New York, New Jersey vicinity, Frank. So I've been able to watch the Nets this year. They're electric. They're exciting. They have dudes on dudes on dudes. And the fact I'll be able to actually watch them on a consistent basis throughout the playoffs it, this is like a dream come true for someone in Texas who roots for the New York, New Jersey sports teams. With that being said, you talk about Harden's playoff deficiencies. You talk about Steve Nash's shortcomings in the big moments. Kevin Durant's a two-time finals MVP. Kyrie Irving hit arguably the biggest shot in NBA finals history. So there is some counterbalance between the haves and the have-nots on the team and you're, you look at any roster, and unless it's like the Lakers who brought everyone back, who everyone has championship experience, like most of these teams that haven't won it yet have a couple of guys who have and a couple of guys who have not. I do think the Harden hasn't done it, Nash hasn't done it. Narrative is being overblown a little bit because with Nash, the Nets are the most talented team in the league, and as long as they do what they're supposed to do and stay healthy, they should be able to compete with anyone in the league. And then with Harden – this is not the same James Harden role we've seen him fall short of that he that he was playing in Houston. It's not all on his shoulders now. It is on – Eli just got – hold up, breaking news, breaking news. Eli finally responded, quote, maybe embellished a little bit, 
but I went through the tape of practice yesterday. He is that ripped. Okay. So breaking news from Miami's video coordinator, Jimmy Butler still ripped. Uh, breaking news on the show. Put it out there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Harden just in a different role. He's not the only guy who can create offense. He's more of a facilitator now than he's ever been. And I think that's a good role for him coming back off that hamstring injury where it's not going to be on him to go one-on-one 30 times a game. He could ease into it, get the ball to the open guy. And if Durant's feeling it, if Kyrie's feeling it, if Harris is feeling it, hell, if Landry Shamit has a game like he had down the stretch where he had 24 points on six or seven shooting from three. Like they just have so many weapons. If they do what they're supposed to do, they should win. And last, last point in the playoffs. In the playoffs, defense steps up. It just, it's not the regular season. The regular season, people don't play defense. The Nets played very, very met defense. I do think they will put more effort on that side of the ball. And the difference, differentiating factor between the Nets and every other team in the East is they have four guys who get you 20 on any given night. And in the playoffs, you need a guy who can just make shots and get points. And I still don't trust Giannis in a playoff situation in the last two minutes to be a consistent bucket getter. I still don't trust Ben Simmons in that situation to be a consistent bucket getter. And that gives Philadelphia one guy who I trust. It gives Milwaukee two guys who I trust, even though Middleton and Holiday are on the lower end of that trust level. And I still think with Kyrie, Harden, and Irving, the Nets have three. Kyrie, Harden, Durant. What did I say? Kyrie, Harden, and Irving. (laughs) Yeah, with the Nets' big three, excuse me. My voice is shaky, so you you can blame it on the head. With the Nets' big three, they have three legitimate guys who at any point in the shot clock, in any point of the game, can get a good look for themselves or someone else when the defense steps up. And that's the difference between what Brooklyn has in their big three and what Milwaukee has in theirs and or what Philadelphia has in theirs. is They both have one guy who can't consistently get a good look against locked-in playoff defense. The Nets do. So, I just decided that I, I want to win this so badly for the Nets – just to shut those stupid Knicks fans. I'm so sick of hearing about the stupid Knicks. All I hear about is the Knicks and how Julius Randle, if he were running for mayor, would win unanimously. I'm sick of hearing the freaking Knicks. The, the Knicks are, listen, they may make the second round, but give me a break here. The Nets, the Nets are the way more viable franchise, and I'm sick and tired of the stupid Knicks. Enough. Enough. You have, Julius Randle's your best player. You're not going anywhere. That's it. It's over. They're losing in the first round. Are we on the <laughs> that, same page there? That'd be great. All right, let's uh, wait, wait. Uh, why talk about the Knicks? Should we talk about our most hated teams? I feel like the Knicks are going to be on both of our lists. No, 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 all right, all right. So we, we last week we uh, we floated out the idea of uh, ranking the teams we hate, and uh, so here's here's my list right now. Uh, number one is the Houston Astros. I mean, pretty. Uh, I'm not sure if that's shocking or expected, but here's my rationale: the they took two championships from me. In 2017, that team would have won. In 2019, that team would have won, and with their cheating bullcrap tactics they, they took it away from me and i will never forgive them for it and it's it's just made the whole microscope of the nets i'm sorry of the yankees just not winning even even bigger because because of the freaking astros cheating number two is the red Sox. uh i don't know if that'll ever change number three is the is the celtics i i can't stand the celtics uh even though like they're they shouldn't be much of a problem for the nets here uh, they, they ruined my life for around eight years after that trade, and that's unforgivable. The Patriots are on there, too. Uh, but I, honestly, like, I don't hate the Patriots because I, I just blame the Jets. A, a, any hardships that happen with the Jets, it, it's their fault. And it's, not, it's nothing the Patriots did. This is all in the Jets. Uh, number five I have is the Mets. I can't stand the Mets fans when they're, when they're like, once they get like a little win a few games, they, they don't stop talking. And I, I find them very, very obnoxious, even though they've had a lot of hardship as well. And then number six on my list is the New York football giants. There you go. All right. Well, we have, we have a lot of the same teams. Uh, the Celtics are my number one most hated wow. team. Really? I just, I just cannot stand the Celtics. It, it's probably because I went to school in Boston, but I like the Patriots aren't on my list. I don't hate the Patriots. I hate Patriots. Well, you beat them. You, they, you, you owe the Patriots credit for getting you those two Super Bowls. I, I guess I, I don't hate the Patriots. Celtics and Red Sox are one and two for me. The Astros are three. The Baltimore Ravens are four. I hate the Ravens, and it's definitely an Afro Pat immediate attribute, but I can't stand the Ravens, and the Knicks are five. So it's probably more based on fan bases than the actual teams themselves. 
But the Celtics, anytime they win, it hurts. It, it cuts deep into my soul. That's why this first round series is going to be so enjoyable when the Nets sweep them. And all Celtics fans have to watch Kyrie Irving just, you know, go give Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown a hug after he drops 40 on them. And they just have to look at that and be like, we lost. Like, yeah. You can't say anything. You that, lost. That, uh, by the way, it's crazy. Game five, game three isn't until a week from today. Game three is a week from today. They play Sunday, Tuesday, and then they get on Friday. So they're really, really uh, drawing, dragging this thing out for, for every minute it's worth. But let's get to our picks real quick for each of these series. Uh, Nets, Nets, Celtics, how many games does it go? Who wins? Nets in four. Sweet, baby. I'm going to go Nets in five. Heat, Bucks. Heat in seven. Wow. I'm going Bucks in six. Uh, Knicks, Hawks. Hawks in five. Wow, you think they win five? Like that, that, that I, I don't know if I, I, I think, I think the Hawks win in seven. I, I think that's a seven gamer. I think those teams are really, really evenly matched. Last one in the Eastern Conference 76ers, Wizards. Sixers, five. I think the Sixers sweep them. Uh, Western Conference, uh, let's start with the Lakers and the Suns. Lakers are open up as, as minus 300 favorites. Last check, it was like minus 145 to win that series. Okay, can we talk about that real quick? I think the Suns won the series. No, no, they don't. But I, I, listen, from no, I didn't. Nope, nope, nope. No, 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 no. The Lakers. I watched. When they, when, no, stop. When the Lakers have LeBron and Anthony Davis, it's not, it's not a contest. It's over. But look, it's LeBron done. was an absolute shell of himself against the Warriors. He could barely he picked show. it up in the. He picked it up in the second half, and he got a triple double, and he hit the biggest shot of the game. That they needed that to to get their confidence up for these playoffs. LeBron is going to be a madman. Lakers in five. Uh, I'm going Suns in seven. Okay, you can think that. Uh, Nuggets, Blazers. I, I think you got to go with with Portland here. I mean, I, as great as the Nuggets have been without Jamal Murray, like at, this, at, at some point here, talent's got to got to win out, and the Blazers are just the more talented team. I'm going Nuggets in seven. Jokic is the best player in the series. I'm yeah, taking. But, the best but, okay, that's fine. Uh, Clippers, Mavericks. A lot, this is really sucks for Luca because he's going up against probably the most complete team in the West. I got the Clippers in, in six. Uh, as do I. Clippers in six. Last one, Jazz. Well, we can't pick the Jazz one yet because Warriors Grizzlies is tonight. Who wins tonight? Warriors or Grizzlies? The Warriors win tonight, and the Jazz win the series in six. All right. Uh, last last preview picks for the NBA playoffs. Who is your NBA Finals matchup, and who wins? Brooklyn over Los Angeles. You just said the Suns are winning the series. So you the just Clippers. The Clippers. The Clippers. Gotcha. That was good. Put that on a quote board, Frank. I got the Nets over the Clippers in six. I'm going yeah, you, with that. Uh, you can't even respond to that. You just got so hoodwinked. I'm going. I I, I really hope it's the Nets, and uh, I think they're gonna. I think the Lakers make it to the finals. I, th- I think that, that those guys are. Just, I mean, assuming that they they don't get hurt again, which who, who I mean, who knows? Nets, Lakers, Nets in seven. Let's go parade down Atlanta Ave, Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn. I'll be the only one there. I'll I'll, I'll fly back for that. I will absolutely fly back for that. All right, me and you. That's going to be great. <laughs> It'll be me, you, and the Knicks <laughs> playoff parade down whatever, Times Square. It's going to be electric. All right, uh, a couple of Yankees notes here real quick before before we wrap this thing up. Corey Kluber, first no-hitter for the Yankees since David Cohn in 1999. I sat in the same spot the entire game, did not move. Uh, I usually like watching the games at the gym because I guess my adrenaline going, but – Did you watch the whole game? I watched every single pitch. I uh, Listen, every game – every Yankee game, every – baseball game I watch I'm always always aware of does he have a perfect game going does he have a no hitter going from the very first batter of the game it's always on my mind and uh it was funny watching the game hearing Michael K like because you knew you knew he thought it he just uh he just did he didn't say it until the after the sixth inning once they got the final out of the sixth inning was his first actual acknowledgement of what was going on and it was uh I was just sitting there laughing because I knew that he didn't want to say it because if he did say something, then he would get a roast on social media for ruining the no-hitter. But very, very cool moment for Corey Kluber. Uh, it kind of took a little bit of the steam away, the fact that there was one the night before and there have been six in Major League Baseball this season. Uh, so that, that made it a little less fun in that regard. I'm just going to say this. Like, A, awesome for Corey Kluber. He's been pretty good lately. You know, he started the season started the season rough, but he's been, he's been really good for the Yankees lately. Frank, I just don't care about no-hitters. I, I can't get ex- – and I know it's we've had six in the first six weeks of the season. The The league's just different. Dudes strike out so frequently. The shift 
puts them in positions to knock down hard hit balls in places that should be a hit 99 of a hundred times. I just, I, even when it was Kluber, like I only watched an inning of the game I, I was working. So maybe if I watched it, I would have been a little more into it, but like, cool. Cool. Like, like, I, I don't know, like Spencer Turnbull. Like, I don't care that he threw a no hitter or the guy in the Padres. I don't even remember. I, well, he threw two, I, I don't forget. I don't care. Like if Kershaw did it or if Garrett Cole did it, I'm sure I'd be like, Oh, what's like the goat. But these no name dudes, like, it's such an anomaly, but a frequent anomaly. Now, I I just frankly don't care. I, I I'll always be excited by them. It, it is starting to get a little, uh, admittedly, a little overdone. Little, sorry, a little overblown here with how many have been. But still exciting. That, I mean, the Yankees haven't had one since the summer after we were in kindergarten. So it's been it's been a really really long time. Uh, another note for the Yankees: they've been to forty eight double plays this season. Uh, it's it's crazy. Every time they have run around first and less than two outs, like, it's, it's basically an automatic double play. It's unbelievable. Like I can't, I can't handle double double plays. Are so infuriating. Ultimate rally killer. And the Yankees just have all these slow dudes who just can't beat out a ground ball to first. And it's, it's driving me absolutely crazy. Giancarlo Stanton back on the IL. Surprise, surprise. I was at the Yankee game on May fourth or May sorry May fifth, uh, and or whatever day it was. But against the Astros, the Thursday game they lost, and the crowd was chanting MVP. And I was, I, I just like looked around. And I was like, what the hell is wrong with you people? Like, it's early May, and we're crying this dude the MVP. Let him play and be healthy, like, a whole year first before we put him in the MVP competition. I thought that was absolutely ridiculous. I let the crowd know that I felt that way, and uh, that was the end of that. I thought that was very, very silly. Uh, Derek Jeter's getting a six-part documentary on getting the Michael Jordan treatment. What do you thoughts about that? Six, Mike, MJ treatment for Derek Jeter. He's not the GOAT of baseball. So, first and foremost, as much as we love the captain, he is not in the same stratosphere of – caliber of players Jordan was I think his story is really cool though and I think you could do a great documentary on it with you know them winning the back-to-back-to-back-to-back championships him being the captain the way he went out his final season his 3,000 hit was the home run his last game he hits the walk-off like a lot of great moments what worries me a little bit is he's part of the editorial or producer role on the documentary well, so, so, so is Jordan and it came out afterwards that Jordan didn't change a single thing. But he had final say, though. Yeah, I, I know, I know. But it came out that he he didn't change it. And I, I hope Jeter does the same thing. I hope he takes a step back, lets the producers and the documentary crew do their job. I I, I wish Jordan didn't have final say in the last dance. I wish Jordan didn't have last. Uh, Jeter didn't have last say in the captain. I wish Brady didn't have the last say in his documentary. I, I wish it was more. Not unbiased, but more the, – the, the subject was less hands-on to tell the story. They want to tell and more let the story just be what it is. But I'm curious, are we going to see any gift baskets from Jordan? Like, I mean, from Jeter? Like, that's what I want to know. Are we going right. to see any no. of the inside part it's, of his life that – It's only going to be – it's only going to be, like, good stuff. But the, the, the thing with these Yankees, like, documentaries and, like, when they recap, like, the, the careers of these players, like, I hate having to think about the old 2003 World Series – what happened in 2004, the, and, like, I, 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 just, I, I just honestly, I'd rather you not discuss those because I, I'll just shut it off. I have no interest in watching anything 2004 related. I just, I just can't. I, it, it's such oh, wait, a pain. Was that the, the Jabba? The, Are you kidding me? Four? I'm drawing a blank right now. Well, it, it's good, though. The fact that you've drawn a blank is great because I don't want to ever think about it ever again. Well, I, I remember 03. What was 04? All right, moving on. Uh, Shohei Otani... <laughs> Is uh, sorry. Last thing, Tony Larusa is. Uh, I'm looking up 04 right now. Hold oh on. Oh my god! Don't do this to yourself. <laughs> All right, go. What about what about? So Tony Larusa has caused a stir in Major League Baseball because. Oh, of- oh my! How did I forget? Holy sh! Holy crap! Sorry, sorry. I I literally had erased it from my memory. That's why I couldn't think of it. Oh yeah. my goodness! All right. Oh yeah. On. No. Moving on, uh, Tony LaRusso caused a big stir. Wait, wait, was that? Well, do you think 03 was worse than 01? Well, they, they both suck. I mean, I, I don't really, I really don't want to talk about it anymore. Um, Tony LaRusso caused a big stir in Major League Baseball when he uh, criticized his own player for not uh, listening to him. He told him to take a pitch on a 3 0 against a position player, ended up hitting a home run, and then and called him out again, saying he's going to face, uh, face retribution in the clubhouse for not listening to the manager. I just think it's great. I think it's hilarious. Uh, Tony LaRusso is so out of touch with reality. And the fact that uh, 
that he just has the audacity to just sit there and and make these outlandish remarks about his players and not have their backs. I think it's hilarious. It's great for baseball. Huge talking point. The White Sox have won. They're, they have the best record, I believe, in, in the American League at the, at the very least. And uh, it's great. Great story. Great talking. And uh, huge fan. La Russa is so wrong that he's hysterically right. And if we erase all the La Russas from baseball, we'll never have these hysterical, ridiculous conversations about the old man yelling at the clouds for no reason. So La Russa, keep being you. Can you imagine if he wins manager of the year this year with his style? He, honestly, honestly, he might get fired. He might, he, he, he might become the first manager of like a first place team to get fired. That's what I'm saying. That, that's why it's perfect. He's so out of touch with reality and he's so – backwards thinking and old school thinking to what baseball is today that he doesn't fit in with the modern era of baseball yet his team is really good and it's crazy they've lost two of their best players Aloy Jimenez and Luis Robert Jimenez I believe is they're both out until like September and so it, it's, it's it's like what's the most random food combination that you would never expect to be good but it just works like off the top of my head I'm trying to think of something random but I can't think of something. But it's like it's like that. Like it's two things you would never expect to go together, and I, somehow it works in beauty. Like sauerkraut on a hot dog. Who would think like rotten onions on a hot dog would be good? But it's delicious. All right, uh, Yankees big series tonight against the White Sox. But listen, the Yankees offense as 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 exciting as the pitching has been the, the past three games. They uh they can't they can't hit, and uh, they they're facing Carlos Rodon tonight, who's throwing one of those eight no, six no hitters. Uh, Yankees, listen, you can't, ha- this can't continue. Like we, we got to like make a statement here against this White Sox team. Get, get a couple hits, get this offense going here. I, I, I can't sit through another game where, where the opposing pitchers are shutting us down as 12 strikeouts to four innings. I just, I just, I just can't, I can't keep, I can't keep watching that. You're just like starting to lose me here. I'm getting really, really frustrated. Uh, but let's make a statement here against the White Sox. Win at least two out of three, show them who's boss. And let's, this needs to be a series where the Yankees stake their claim as like the team to beat in the American League. Like I know it's I know it's you know the, the tail end of May. We're not even reached June yet, but let's go. This is this is a measuring six series for the Yankees. Go out there and show us that we belong here with the, with these teams. Last thing, uh, Shohei Otani, man, the, the what up? This, he's a great talent, but this whole like unless he might be the most talented baseball player since Babe Ruth. I don't know. I don't really care to be honest with you, but. Well, what I, oh, well I, I will always hold against Shohei Otani is the fact that he's the reason why the Yankees ended up with Giancarlo Stanton because he refused to meet with them. The Yankees were like, oh, my God, we need to do something. And then they ended up getting Stanton. And I will never forgive him for that. And that's why I will always destroy Otani on Twitter. I will always, I will never, never support anything he does because he's the reason why I have to deal with Giancarlo Stanton for the rest of my life because that's, he has a lifetime contract with the Yankees because they freaked out when he refused to take a meeting. And now – my life has become a misery all because of you Shohei Otani. I, I, I hope that I wish you the best of luck, but I, I, I don't wish you any success in major league baseball. Did you, I didn't know Otani was ripped. Like that dude is jacked. I saw a picture from the other day doing a locker room interview with a cutoff on him. He always just looked like a skinny dude to me, but that dude is massive. So no wonder he hits bombs and throws a hundred. I didn't realize, or I guess I realized and just forgot that Otani not taking the meeting with the Yankees inadvertently led to them getting Stanton. And now that you say it, <laughs> I may have to change my opinion on good old Shohei. He's, nah. he's electric to watch. He is really fun to watch though. I, I know. I can't, I can't believe you're ruining Shohei for me. I really like Shohei. And now. I mean, listen, I, I, I just, I'm consistently, I, I said the other day on Twitter that like, all right, enough of the little tiny love fest hashtag enough. And then all these people just like came at me like, you're like you're a loser. You're 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 not you're not you don't like fun. But this this isn't a this isn't a this is about the fact that he has forced Stan on my lap. And <laughs> who who came at you? A bunch of people that I work with that, that were just like you're, you're out of you're out of your mind. This is like he's like the most exciting player in baseball history. And I, I just I, I'm gonna I go tell him, I'm gonna go tell him they're wrong right now. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. But that'll do it. For this edition of Lucas Lucas Podcast, let's go Nets. Let's go Yankees. Sweep the White Sox. Sweep the Celtics. We'll see you in the second round against the Heat of the Bucks. Let's go.